If you said to me to describe this story, I would say, don't believe it, but it's true. I can't even imagine somebody doing something like this. It's also the perfect crime, because sometimes the thing that's blatant right in front of your face is a thing you don't expect. I was going to be a million dollar winner. I was game for something exhilarating. From 1989 to 2001, there were almost no legitimate winners of the high value game pieces in the McDonald's Monopoly game. Uncle Jerry told me, if you want a game piece, this is how it's done. Hi, I'm James Lee Hernandez. And I'm Brian Lazarte. We are the executive producers and directors of McMillions, a documentary series on HBO. And this is the official McMillions podcast, episode four. In this episode, we'll talk to George Chandler, a $1 million winner within the McDonald's Monopoly game who is roped in by his foster father, Dwight Baker. We'll also have some deleted scenes. We'll answer some listener questions. But first, let's recap what actually happened in episode four. We ended episode three on the car crash. And episode four, we learn about Jerry Colombo dies. Was it a hit? Mm. We don't know. We also get to meet A.J. Glum, a new recruiter in the whole stable of Jerry Jacobson's fraud. And beyond A.J., uh, Jerry Jacobson pulled in Dwight Baker into his recruiting family, and Dwight Baker then brought in his son, his foster son, George Chandler. And the episode ends with Dwight Baker chasing down his sister-in-law when she tries to run with $500,000. We always referred to this episode as The Greed Goes On because you have Jerry Colombo and Jerry Jacobson teaming up, running this game for years and years. And as soon as Jerry Colombo is out of the picture, you could l- rightly think, well, Jerry Jacobson's done. He made his money. He's going to stop. But he let greed get to him, and he brings in completely new recruiters and even expands larger than he ever had done it before. So... James, what do you think? Was it a hit? It's tough to say. I mean, the scenario is they're driving in a car. They get hit by a truck. But is this something that was planned? A lot of times within organized crime, specifically the mafia, they don't just try to take the person out that they're going after. They try to take out everyone involved with them. We will continue to dive into this topic in the series, but you never know. Yeah. Frank and Heather sort of make this assumption that if it could be a hit, perhaps was it in any way tied to the fact that Jerry Jacobson and Robin Colombo might have had a thing, and this was their attempt to get Jerry Colombo out of the mix? We actually don't believe that to be the case. Now, we have a very special guest. George Chandler, the foster son of Dwight Baker, and he won $1 million. And what he thought was a good business decision might not be exactly what he originally planned. I'm George Chandler. I grew up in abject poverty. I was raised Mormon, one of eight kids, and we grew up here in rural Oconee County, South Carolina. And we were poor. I didn't have running water until 1986. So, I mean, we're not talking about ancient history here. We're talking about 1986. People, most people have running water at that point in time. We were still using a well. What do you think? Dwight was very successful. He had a family. He had five kids. I became friends with his son. And when I was about 12, I left home. Dwight Baker was a foster father to me for a time. Well, George and I, I mean, we... And originally, we went to church together, families. So we took him in. We became foster parents with George, and uh, he grew up with our kids. Please welcome George Chandler. How you doing? Better than I deserve. <laughs> Thank you for um, talking to us on the podcast. Yeah, I'm glad to do it. We have one large burning question that we need to ask, and that is, <laughs> what is your favorite karaoke song? <laughs> Well, actually, karaoke is kind of a thing that you do when 
there's no other live band around. I, you know, I love music and I love playing with guys and playing live bands and, and singing and that sort of thing. Karaoke is kind of a, a band-aid or a good release to do, especially in an environment like that down at the hideaway. It's a lot of fun because we're all friends and nobody's, you know, nobody's really paying attention to the quality uh, as much as we are, just uh, <laughs> just the fun we're having. My favorite karaoke song, I, I don't know. I, I'd have to think about that. I'm a country kind of guy and a traditionalist. I'll have to go to one of those old Christopherson songs or maybe old violin or uh, maybe some Merle Haggard. I don't know. It'd be hard to nail down a, a favorite. But I'll tell you what, y'all come on out again, and we'll try them all out for a little while. All right. We can't wait. <laughs> Speaking of singing, did you sing to your cows this morning? Every day. Every day. Did you just do that on your own, or did someone tell you this is what you do to bond with them or something? <laughs> well, I think they're uh, pretty comfortable with it, and uh, and it may be possibly, there's a remote possibility that they only like it, uh, like me being there because I'm bringing the feed. I <laughs> but I really believe, I personally think that it's because of the singing. <laughs> yeah. Hey, it works on us. How often did you eat at McDonald's and play the game prior to uh, your foster father coming to you with the ticket? Oh, regularly. Uh, you know, like every other American probably. It wasn't necessarily a go-to place for me, but Russell was eight or nine at the time, and if you got a kid in the car and you pass McDonald's, they're going to want to run through there. And so having Russell, it was just a given, you know, we're, we're going to be eating at McDonald's occasionally. Were you very familiar with the game prior to your foster father, Dwight Baker, coming to you with the game piece? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, everybody played the game in some way or another. I don't know that, you know, you actually sit down at the kitchen table or I personally actually sit down at the kitchen table and gather these game pieces, but everybody's looking for the, the rare and exclusive ticket that, you know, to win. Yeah, so, yeah, I was very familiar with it. Brian and I have, have talked a lot about this, how easy it would be to make the decision that you made because you had someone that you had conducted business with, someone you trusted come to you and say, there's an opportunity. Can you talk a little bit about your relationship with Dwight and how things like that just didn't necessarily seem out of the ordinary? I think everybody in their life has one or two people that they trust implicitly in every way and rely upon and you know, it's the kind of person that you can call at three o'clock in the morning when you're on the side of the road with a flat tire and you know they're going to get up and put the keys in the car they've always got your back and Dwight Baker was that person one of those people to me you know when he came to me I had no reservation at all that anything that he would ever do would be illegal. I mean, he was raised in the same religion I was raised in. I want to emphasize was. It has a lot of focus on being honorable in the community and, and et cetera. I never would have questioned his uh, motivation on or the origin of the ticket or anything like that. It never occurred to me. You can call it naivety. And it also, it wasn't presented in a way that it was like, like too good to be true. You've heard the adage, you know, if, if something seems too good to be true, it probably is. And I think that may be the case most of the time. But in this case, it wasn't presented that way. It was more of a pretty decent business transaction. And that's the way I approached it. By the time Dwight had approached me with this ticket, I had already ran a multi-million dollar company. So I, I was no stranger to making decisions that involved good sums of money calculating the risk and, and uh, return and from an investment perspective. It just wasn't an outstanding, over-the-top kind of deal. It was a good deal, and I did it. It's just that simple. The way that he approached you, he told you a story about a friend that was going through a divorce, and they needed somebody to claim this so that he wouldn't have to pay half of it to, to his wife. And you had just gone through a pretty messy divorce yourself. Well, I think all divorces are messy. And touche. But I, I had been through a divorce and um 
I had the ability to understand what this person out there, person that I didn't know, but had this story was dealing with. It made a lot of sense to me that, you know, they're already separated and they're getting ready to get divorced. He gets lucky, peels this ticket off. Well, of course he doesn't want to have that counted as marital property. So it made a lot of sense to me why he would take this approach. And, and I didn't have any moral reservations about it. Having been through a divorce myself, having seen how people you love can in almost an instant turn on you or do a 180 and uh, instead of giving, being on the taking end of everything and every possible opportunity, I wouldn't have wanted to be in his position. That made a lot of sense to me too. The the story and it and it coming from Dwight just gave it all the more genuineness. And so I I never questioned the validity of the story. I never questioned uh, the fact that this guy even existed. Of course, now we know that he didn't. But at the time, it was uh, completely uh, legitimate, and viable to me anyway. When you first won. What sort of impact did that have on you and your family? Uh, it was mostly negative. I wasn't financially struggling at the time. I was already a very successful businessman. I had several businesses running, and people knew that. People in the community know me pretty well. And people come out of the woodwork wanting something, uh, wanting a favor, or, or get a letter in the mail just blatantly wanting money, you know, asking for money, asking for financial help. A lot of that kind of stuff uh, went on. That's kind of hard for a guy like me to deal with because my natural tendency is to be a, a helper, you know, to, to help people. And the whole decision to, to buy the, the ticket was just part of another business decision that I would make that I thought was the right thing to do. At the time, I was buying rental property. I was starting companies and developing other ways to make a living. At the time, you also had some extra motivation because not only did you go through a divorce, but you also had a son. Russell's 28 now. Back then, he was eight or nine. I viewed it as, a, as one more way to provide for my family. I'm one of eight kids. I know what it's like to be poor. I know what it's like to, to not have things and to have to work hard, twice as hard, in fact, to get ahead. Uh, and part of that is providing for your posterity. You know, nobody provided for, for me. My father died last July, July the 6th, four days before my birthday, and he was a good man, but he didn't leave anything behind for his kids, for his posterity. I always had the thought in my mind that during my working years, I should be building an estate, you know, something that I could make it a little bit easier on my, my kids. And George, how many kids do you have now? Uh, I forgot. Um, I've lost count. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, it's seven. We had a chance to, to interview your son, Russell, who, who appears in the series. We also interviewed your stepdaughter, Taylor, who we loved meeting, and we did not include her in this episode. And she had a few things to tell us about growing up. Here's actually a deleted scene from, from the series. My name is Taylor. George is my stepdad. So my mother and him were together uh, ever since I was born. He's, he's my dad. Throughout my childhood, George was very involved. Um, he was always at my dance competitions, always the one sewing my dance costumes, makeup he was even a participant in. My mom was too, but he was more, he enjoyed it more, and you could tell. Dance was a big part of my childhood, and he always participated in the father dance. So basically, like, all the dance dads put on a show, and he was, like, the star of it. One year, he actually did a toe touch. Basically, you jump and touch your toes, so your legs go out and your arms touch your toes in front of, like, everyone, like, a huge audience, and he went out there, and, like, it was actually pretty good. And the jump was high, too, so that, that's also a big deal. 
So the main question, main reason we played that for you is, can you still do a toe touch? <laughs> if you could see me, that's the wonderful part about radio, right? If you could see me, I'm blushing. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, I really am. Yes, I can. <laughs> I can. <laughs> Please send us a it, picture. <clears throat> it might not be as attractive as it was then, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I can still do one. <laughs> Wow. How did it feel hearing Taylor talk about growing up with you? Well, it's kind of emotional, actually. Kids are bring a unique perspective on the world. Taylor is so animated, and uh, uh, she's been such a joy in my life. I can't really explain it to you. I can tell you there are times that I, would, uh, that I could kill her. Uh, <laughs> but, yeah, but I can also say that all the time, I would kill for her. She's just a, a wonderful person, and uh, being my daughter, I, of course, I'm a little bit prejudiced there, but um, thanks for uh, reminding me of that, that interview. I, I don't know that I've heard that before, but I'm appreciative of you, of you playing that for me. It's uh, really special to me to hear that. You know, you talk about how life would be different for your kids, potentially a little bit easier. And one of the deleted scenes we had talked to your kids about what it was like for them. And here it is. My name is George Russell Chandler II, and George Russell Chandler Sr. is my father. So the way that the whole incident affected our lives, uh, my life particularly, uh, you know, as a 10-year-old, that, that's the impressionistic point in your life. So you always, uh, you always want to lean on your dad or your mom. Kids are mean. You know, when kids think, hear things from their parents and their parents don't always know details about the situation. So that was hard when I was younger. You always get asked about it and people want to know why in the world this happened. And, you know, isn't your dad the one that got arrested for that fake thing? And at that point, uh, you, you want to get upset. You really do, but you can't. You, you have to say, well, if you'd like, if you really want to know the story, you can sit down and talk with me. Let's have, uh, you know, let's have dinner or something. People just jump to conclusions, and it, and it hurts you. I, I vividly remember being in elementary school and moving schools. And when I came to a new school, a lot of kids, their parents were uh, involved in, like, the police force. You know, like, you know, they would tell me, like, oh, like your dad stole from McDonald's and that's why you live in a big house. That's why your mom drives a brand new Escalade at the time. And like, oh, this is why you get to take all these dance classes. And that's why you get to travel with dance. And you know, you, this is, that's why you get to dress like the way you dress. And, and I remember being like, no, that's not why. The reason why I get to do that is because my dad is an incredibly smart man who works super hard for his money. He built his own, you know, business and everything. And that's why I get to have these things, do these things. But kids never, I guess, understood that. We were kids and guys would come up to me like, hey, let, let me go get me a fake ticket. I wonder if I can cash it in myself. You want to be upset, and it, but it hurts you more than anything. It's really hurtful. For the rest of your life, that's going to dig deep. I don't know how else to describe the feeling of hurt and anger at the same time, but that's exactly what it is. You, you figure out ways to cope with it. You figure out how to tell people off politely. I mean, really, yeah, I know yeah. that sounds crazy, but that's how you do that. And it, it, once you learn that, it makes it a little easier. So yeah. My dad's my hero. He is all of our heroes. Everybody wants a dad like George Chandler. Everybody. Because I promise you, the epitome of a great father is that. And it's hard to have people come up to you much, talking about you personally, okay, cool, but then you talk about right, my dad. dad. Yeah. You're gonna talk about you don't you, that that's hurtful, and I don't know that closure will ever come from that. I think it'll always be an open wound per se. George, we know that your kids have had to deal with a lot, just like you have. I mean, what is it? it? It feels like the the bond between all of you is so strong, and they're they're ready to have your back in an instant. Yeah, that's pretty pretty tough. Uh, to listen to. They're strong kids and they're smart. They know the whole story, and uh, but they know, more importantly, they know through my actions and how I live my life what, what kind of fellow I am. I'll take their uh, accolades. I wish they didn't have to deal with it, 
if nothing else, it uh, improves their debating skills. <laughs> <laughs> well, they obviously think the world of you. But I was working when I was 12 years old. I was working over the summer as a bricklayer's helper, carrying bricks and mixing mortar and that sort of thing. So, I, yeah, I learned early on that you had to work to make money. That's really all I've ever done. How did you learn to be a farmer? Uh, just bad luck. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, yeah, I grew up, we lived on old farms that we rented, and oftentimes there were cattle there and horses and that sort of thing. We always had chickens and goats and rabbits, and I think you you kind of get a uh, a heart for that kind of thing. And well, Dwight ends up really letting his his greed take hold. What do you know about when he tried to chase his... Uh, sister-in-law down at the airport. Well, I wasn't familiar with that story until you guys were actually out here filming. I was kind of shocked to see it kind of play out on, on episode four there. I could imagine what Dwight must have been feeling like at that moment. It just goes to show you what greed will do to you, I guess, right? True. This was an intense moment where Dwight Baker and Linda Baker, his wife, were going after Brenda. And so the FBI, like, they have rules. They never want to, if they're on a wire, they actually don't ever interfere unless they think someone could potentially be in harm. They were really concerned that potentially harm was going to happen to Brenda Phoenix. They, It's actually their obligation to intervene. My knee jerk is that it's a little overblown, but if I take a step back and put myself in their shoes, people in some van someplace monitoring calls, I would probably have to give it credibility too and, and do pull out all the stops, you know, do send the send in the troops. When you originally talked to Dwight about working together on this, did you know that he was gonna keep going? When Dwight originally approached me with the ticket, it was coming from somebody he had a relationship with in his real estate business. I had no idea that there had been other tickets or would ever be other tickets given to other people. And I was obviously disappointed to find out that that was not the case, but I did not find that out until after the uh, indictments. How do you think your life would be different had you never agreed to take that game piece? I don't know. I, we don't have that option. I've laid in bed at night and wondered about other things. You know, if I hadn't have done this or if I hadn't have done that. or I think that's the human condition. Uh, we, we do that. But if you spend a lot of time focusing on that, then you don't have the ability to focus on what we are going to do tomorrow and the decisions we're going to make tomorrow. So... If I hadn't have participated in the McDonald's thing, undoubtedly some things would have been easier. Some things would have been more normal, uh, especially for Russell and my kids. And But normal's boring. I don't have any regrets. I, uh, I don't have a single regret. I, if I had it to do all over again, gentlemen, I would do it again. And present it in the same conditions, in the same light, in the same context without the knowledge that I have, obviously, after the fact, I would absolutely do it again. Can you ship us some of the sweet tea we had at your place? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can. Uh, <laughs> I can get you some tea. That, uh, that tea comes from Sherry Lay Holbrooks. Sherry is a longtime friend of mine and caterer. Sherry, we love you, and you make good sweet tea. Yeah, so I'll try to get her to ship you some tea. In the upcoming episodes, we will learn a bit more about you and the challenges that you faced, and there's going to be some surprises. It's painful to watch in places, embarrassing in places, interesting in places, but overall, I'm, um, so far, I'm, I'm happy with the level of integrity. Well, it was really easy with you. We just turned the camera on and let you be you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, 
I'll, I'll take that as a compliment. But yeah, uh, it, definitely. It, it's a lot of fun. You know, I'm still having fun. You know, uh, all you got to do is drop in on me uh, one weekend and we'll, uh, we'll have some more fun. Awesome. Well, <laughs> stay tuned for more from George Chandler in the upcoming episodes. Thank you so much for talking with us on our podcast here. Yeah, thanks, George. Yeah. It's been my pleasure. Thank you. All right, George, you're off the hook. Now you can go uh, have a drink or three. Yeah, well, that's, uh, I think that's an order. Thank you. <laughs> so now we want to answer some of the questions you sent in. First question comes from John Kustuch. He asks, did I miss how Uncle Jerry's name became the focus of the investigation so early on? Was that skipped on purpose or cut from the doc? If you remember in episode one, when Doug Matthews reached out based on that sticky note, he was given three names and this nebulous name of Uncle Jerry being at the root of it. It's in there. All right. And now we have an audio question from Jordan Green. Let's listen to it. Hi, my name is Jordan. I live in Florida. My question is, how is Mark Wahlberg affiliated with your show? Is he a producer or what is his role that he plays in your show? My second question is, did anyone else notice how awkward and strange it was when they were in the house of that guy pretending that he won that check? And the way that Doug rolled up the paper, it was all like he was trying to be all neat. I don't know how to explain it, but what in the fuck was up with that? You can ask Doug that from me. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, to answer the first question, Mark Wahlberg is an executive producer on this project, along with Stephen Levinson, Archie Gipps, Brian, and myself. We teamed up with them to work on this project, and they were a great support group for us and also really helped us, helped back us in directing the series when talking with HBO. As seasoned as they are, uh, they always had great ideas and feedback to offer us along the way. And with what, uh, what was up with Doug Matthews, so you see how Doug Matthews is all the time. The way he is in the interviews within the show, that's how he always is. Now, if you add the extreme kinetic energy uh, and excitement of him being able to go undercover, you're going to heighten, you're, you're going to uh, multiply that several, several times. And that's why he may have acted <laughs> a little extra spazzy during that time. In general, those interviews are just so awkward in a way because you are watching two groups of people lie to each other and you're watching someone that had committed a criminal activity now fully lying to the people that know what's really going on and actually after i um you know open up birthday or holiday gifts i actually wrap my paper the same way that doug did so i, I don't see anything wrong with how he uh he was just flexing for the camera. He was flexing for the camera. <laughs> All right, so our next question is another audio question, and it comes from Lee Gardner. Hi, McMillions Podcast. This is Lee from Seattle. I watched the HBO documentary last night. Safeway recently did a, which is owned by Iwerksons, it's a grocery store chain, but they recently did a Monopoly game. So this is going to be interesting to see if these types of games will be played again, what are your thoughts on this? Everybody wants to the chance to win, even to this day. You got to remember the the scam that happened between 1989 and 2001 involved more than just the monopoly promotions that McDonald's did. They did all these other promotions. So McDonald's ran multiple versions of this game. It wasn't just the McDonald's monopoly game. There were different peel-off prize games that they had run that were branded. There was a, a Who Wants to Be a Millionaire game. There was one for Scrabble. Monopoly just so happened to be the most popular. Right. And the fact that you're seeing it, a similar version of the game out there in Safeway or Albertsons, because they all know that Uncle Jerry is busted and he's not behind this. But it is 
not at all affiliated with the original McDonald's Monopoly game, and uh, we have no reason to believe that there are any shady dealings with Safeway or Albertsons. Maybe we should try to find the winner of that game. <laughs> and have them on the show. And have them on the <laughs> podcast. That would be, that'd be pretty cool. Yep. All right. Our next question comes from Diane Horschler. Just wondering, who made the initial phone call to the FBI that triggered this whole investigation? That is the million-dollar question. Who took this entire thing down? Who helped the FBI discover this was happening? What we learned is the FBI receives multiple complaint calls all the time. Like people who say, like, oh, I think that there's a suspicious package down the street. I don't like my neighbor. Right. So... It came through a complaint call. Rick Dent, supposedly, this might have actually been on his desk for a long time before Doug Matthews actually first saw it. There's a lot of speculation as to who made that phone call. We asked everybody about it, and it was quite interesting how many different... There are a lot of theories on on who it could be and what happened. and We talk a lot more about it. In our last episode, actually. Our next question is from Dara Bryant. How did he, meaning Jerry Jacobson, get the winning pieces through all those layers of security? This was the nagging question that the FBI had. You know, we're following the, the same procedure that the FBI went through when they actually investigated this case, and they didn't find out until the very end. Thank you all so much for sending in those questions. We look forward to answering more in the future. Well... That's it for episode four of the McMillions podcast. If you have any further questions about this episode or any future episode coming up, please contact us. You can email us at mcmillionspodcasts at hbo.com. McMillions spelled with an S, not the normal dollar sign like you'll see all over the internet, television, and really anywhere in the world. And if you want to record your question as a voice memo, please do that and email it to us. We love that. And we'll play it right here on the show. Don't forget to check out McMillions, airing Monday nights at 10 on HBO. And see you next week for episode five of the McMillions podcast. This podcast was produced by FunMeter in conjunction with Unrealistic Ideas. For FunMeter, I'm Brian Lazarte. And I'm James Lee Hernandez. Joe Fensemaker produced this episode. Our consulting producer is Barry Finkel from Pineapple Street Studios. J.P. Hesser mixed this episode. The music heard here comes from our actual series and was composed by Pinar Toprak. Unrealistic Ideas is Mark Wahlberg, Stephen Levinson, and Archie Gibbs. And of course, none of this would be possible without the amazing support of HBO. You can find the McMillions podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, the HBO Go, and Now apps, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening. Later, skater.